Welcome to Achieve CE's very first day of broadcasting a live webinar. We're very excited that you could join us for this historic and momentous occasion. We hope that you find this experience to be both convenient and educational. We plan to be launching an entire library of weekly live webinars starting in March of 2021, after we receive our ACPE accreditation. We will also be introducing a new membership option in February of 2021 that will allow you to access all of our pharmacy courses, both live and non-live, for one low annual cost. Today's webinar is entitled Pharmacology Patient Care Points and is being presented by Professor Pete Kreckel. This activity is one hour long and is accredited through the Florida Board of Pharmacy and CE Broker for Florida Pharmacy Technicians. The activity will consist of a live question and answer session at the conclusion of the presentation. Please enter any questions for the faculty into the question and answer chat box during the presentation. At the conclusion of the webinar, a four digit access code will be displayed on the screen. You will need this four digit access code to pass the one question test and continue to your evaluation in order to earn credit. Your credits will automatically be submitted to CE Broker. If you have any problems, please contact us via live chat or email at info at achievece.com. Professor Pete joins us from Pennsylvania, where he serves as the Director of Clinical Services for Nickman's Drugstore and is an adjunct faculty for the College of Physician Assistant Sciences at St. Francis University. Please join me in welcoming Professor Pete. The title of our program today is Pharmacology Patient Care Points. Hi, I'm Pete Crackle. I'm a registered pharmacist, been doing it for 40 years, and let me tell you a little bit about me. I graduated in 1981 from the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy, so you can tell by the gray hair that I'm an older guy. I'm 62 years old, and I've been practicing as a pharmacist for 40 years now. Counting my internship, we can even say 40 plus years. I began my teaching career, however, at St. Francis University in 2005, and I teach the Physician Assistant Sciences program. I teach everything there. I start teaching them the difference between hey, a cream and an ointment, and I go all the way through to teaching them how to prescribe birth control pills. Currently, I serve as the Director of Clinical Services at Nickman's Drugstore, which is a five-store chain in southwestern Pennsylvania. It's in Fayette County, and I spend two days a week staffing in the pharmacy, so I'm still working behind the counter on the bench like all of you do, as well as two days in the office developing clinical programs for the chain. This activity was developed by Achieve CE, and it's free of any commercial support. I, Pete Crackle, I have no actual or potential conflicts of interest to disclose from presenting this program. Let's take a look at pharmacology patient care points. At the end of this activity, you, the pharmacy technicians, will be able to describe the interdisciplinary interactions of pharmacists and technicians, a very important one. We're also going to recall common problems and questions encountered by pharmacy technicians in the community pharmacy. We're going to determine strategies and product alternatives that will help patients avoid clinically significant drug interactions. You're also going to learn how to triage questions and provide patient profile information for the pharmacist. You know you're a member of a team. Maybe the pharmacist is the quarterback of the team, but for heaven's sakes, we certainly need uh, our technicians to be the offensive linemen and the running backs that uh, protect the pharmacist and make the job possible. So as you can see, I am not addressed as Dr. Crackle. I'm just a community pharmacist. I'm not a PharmD. I graduated from Pitt in 1981. As I said, my wife is also a pharmacist. Everything in pharmacy school was alphabetical order. Her maiden name was Kibitsky. We shared the same lab bench, so we decided to continue the streak, and we've been doing it 40 years later. Well, let's talk about me a little bit more. I practiced in a chain and just for six months. I resigned two weeks after I was told by the district manager, Pete, I've watched you practice, and if you quit talking to those patients, you'll have a lot of time to get your store manager weekly report done. That night I went home and I said to Denise, if this is community pharmacy, I made a serious mistake. Maybe I'll go back to Pitt, get a degree and teach, which is really my first love. I worked for a local independent then shortly after it cop drug for 26 years, had a wonderful career. I saw he'd be uh, selling off to the major chain again. So I got out of there in a hurry and I worked for Thompson Pharmacy for 12 years. 
There I also picked up a job where I worked two days a week at the Empower 3 Center for Health, which is a primary care office. The uh, owner of Thompson Pharmacy is great friends with Zane Gates, who owns uh, the Empower 3 service. And so they have pharmacists from Thompson Pharmacy staffing Empower 3. So a couple days a week in a doctor's office, a couple days a week on the bench. And now, as I said, I'm the director of clinical services at Nickman Drug in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. It's a five-store chain. And our goal was to live closer to Gretchen and Mark and our amazing grandson, Luke. And I've been an adjunct assistant professor of pharmacology at St. Francis since 2005. I've got some quotes for community pharmacy that I think you'll all agree with. Number one is, if you are the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. Always surround yourself with people that know more than you do so you can draw from them. I'm not any smarter than anyone else. I've just had 40 years more than you have to accumulate pharmacology knowledge. We are not competitors, we're colleagues. If it doesn't apply to patient care, it's simply pharmacy trivial pursuit. I also say the difference between a good day and a bad day is not the volume of prescriptions. It's the number and the quality of staff. I also say I can only be good if my texts are great. And I have said it frequently to my wife. I would come home after a busy day of 350 prescriptions and say, that was easy. And I had a couple superstar texts, worked well, no problem at all. I've also worked at other stores and did 125 and came home totally whooped. I understand and I appreciate the value of good pharmacy technicians. So let's talk about pharmacology. Pharmacology is a term that I coined, and because I coined it, I guess I get to define it. So what I define pharmacology is, is pharmacy knowledge that can be applied to patient care. If it can't be applied to that patient standing in front of you, guess what? It's simply pharmacy trivial pursuit. And that's not really what we're all about. We're not to try to show how much we know. We're here to, of course, take better care of our patients. So here's my first example. Research has shown that a healthy adult can tolerate a maximum of around 10,000 units of vitamin A. You've all seen it sitting on your pharmacy shelves. Adverse effects occur when you go over 25,000 units of vitamin A and 30,000 units for ingestion. One pound of polar bear liver, a fist-sized chunk, and barely a meal contains 9 million units of vitamin A. You can die from consuming that much vitamin A. It can knock out your liver. High doses of beta-carotene, a vitamin A analog, seem to increase the risk of lung cancer in smokers. And high doses of vitamin A may increase mortality. Knowing to avoid vitamin A supplementation in smokers is far more critical to our patient's safety than the knowledge of the adverse effects of polar bear liver consumption. Knowing that a pound of polar bear liver contains 9 million units, it's great to sit around and talk about, but it certainly does not apply to patient care. Polar bear liver is not pharmacology. Well, let's talk about a question that you get all the time as technicians, and I get a lot as a pharmacist, Potassium pills, we know those great big 20 milli equivalent pills and our patients will always say, I can't swallow those big horse pills. Uh, can I eat a banana and replace the potassium that way? Well, I never recommend potassium rich foods to replace potassium chloride supplements when they're prescribed because of the following. Well, let's look at a banana. First of all, they contain one milli equivalent per inch. So that's a 10 inch banana is going to be 10 milli equivalents of potassium, but it's also 140 calories. Consider too that bananas cost 59 to 79 cents a pound, depending where you're shopping. So if a patient's on two of those k Dur 20s or those KCL 20s, they're gonna eat four large bananas a day or 600 calories. That is hardly practical. And orange juice, well, we know that's rich in potassium. You get 10 milli equivalents of potassium. You need to drink seven ounces of orange juice, which is also 90 calories. So if we're going to replace that 40 milli equivalents of potassium, 400 calories. That's the last thing our type 2 diabetics and our heart failure patients need. And furthermore, potassium rich foods contain potassium phosphate not potassium chloride, which is important with diuretic loss as well as vomiting and diarrhea. You lose chloride as well as potassium. Now with a banana, you're only replacing the potassium component and not the chloride. 
Let's talk about another drug that you're all familiar with. You probably dispense it a dozen or two times a day, metformin. Everybody takes metformin. I often joke and say we should probably just put it in the water like we do fluoride. I want you, however, as pharmacy technicians to watch for metformin-induced vitamin B12 deficiency. It's a big deal and it's very, very common. Up to 30% of you your patients that are taking metformin therapy will have lower B12 levels, which will lead to B12 deficiency. So we're all familiar with vitamin B12 causing an anemia, causing um, weakness in the blood system. Besides anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency can cause peripheral nerve damage, what our diabetics suffer from all the time. They call it diabetic peripheral neuropathy. I've treated at least four men who were taking metformin who came to me talking about having tingling in their hands and in their feet, and I put them on a vitamin B12 supplement, just 1,000 micrograms a day, orally, once a day, and it went away. Checking the B12 levels if new diabetic peripheral neuropathy or the neuropathy gets worse. The lower B12 levels may cause an increased risk in peripheral neuropathy. And it's hard to distinguish, is it a vitamin B12 deficiency or is it a progression of diabetic peripheral neuropathy? So the treatment, injectables usually not necessary. Just recommend the oral one, 1,000 micrograms once a day is enough. Don't stop the metformin. You all know how valuable metformin is for your type 2 diabetics. And as a side note, I've got some docs, uh, Dr. AB, we'll call him. He prescribes vitamin B12, 1,000 micrograms by mouth daily whenever he puts a patient on metformin therapy. Well, what you can do to help the pharmacist whenever a metformin prescription is processed, especially that 1,000 milligram twice a day, consult with your pharmacist. Say, hey, you might want to check with this guy. Make sure that he is uh, taking a B12 supplement if he's complaining, especially of any tingling in the extremities. This is especially important if you're processing that metformin prescription and you're seeing a Lyrica or a gabapentin prescription alongside of it. Diabetic peripheral neuropathy has the same signs and symptoms as vitamin B12 deficiency. However, the peripheral neuropathy, you do not see an anemia where you do with vitamin B12 deficiency. Another disease state where you can be valuable to your pharmacist is asthma management and COPD. So let's talk about that quote that I always say to my students, back when I was your age, and they start cringing. Well, back when I was your age, here's what we had to deal with. We didn't have albuterol till around 1984. We had isuprel mystometers, which were non-selective beta-1 and beta-2. Remember, the beta-1 receptors, they're on the heart, beta-2 is on the lungs. So if you stimulate both, yes, you're going to open up the lungs, but you're also going to make the heart race. That's why a lot of your patients will complain that they feel that their heart's beating out of their chest when they use albuterol therapy, even though albuterol is a lot more selective than uh, isoproterenol. Alupent, metaproterenol, and epinephrine, primatine, were both non-selective. Unfortunately, and I believe it's unfortunately, the primatine inhaler is back. Please do not recommend that drug too hard on a patient's heart. There was also another one called breath air and bricoline, or bricanil, which was terbutaline. And then in 1984, we got albuterol. And then a little later on, we got leave albuterol. And of course, albuterol and leave albuterol, pretty much the same product. The leave albuterol is the more active isomers of the albuterol, but it's really not of any great benefit. They were hoping it would be less stimulating on the heart. It really hasn't shown to be. So what can you do when you dispense that albuterol inhaler? And I know you do a couple of these a day, probably a couple dozen in some cases. COPD patients that are currently on albuterol are overusing their albuterol inhaler 19% of the time. That's what an SABA is, a short-acting beta agonist. Uh, another study showed the asthmatic patients showed 15.8, 16% overuse of their albuterol inhaler. So the use of an albuterol inhaler more than twice a week for relief of asthma symptoms is a trigger. It indicates inadequate control and the need to step up therapy, either 
add therapy or increase the dose. If they're say on an Advair 100 and they're having, you know, three or four or five breakthroughs a week, they probably need to go to say to an Advair 250. So let's look at the math of this. We all know that albuterol inhalers, whether it's the 6.7 or the 18 grams, they all contain 200 puffs. And according to these standards, a patient well controlled should not use more than four puffs a week. That's two puffs per exacerbation or rescue. If we take 200 puffs, the amount in that albuterol inhaler, and we divide it by those four puffs a week, you get 50 weeks. So how long should an albuterol inhaler last? Actually, if you have a well-controlled asthmatic patient who's taken their meds the way they should, that albuterol inhaler should last them for one year if they're well controlled. So the question is, should we ever really even have refills on albuterol? I tell my physician assistant students at St. Francis, I would not put five refills on an albuterol prescription because you wanna monitor every time they need an albuterol inhaler to see if indeed, first of all, are they taking their maintenance inhaler? And secondly, uh, do we need to step up their therapy? Pharmacy technicians can certainly help. Anytime an asthma patient is using an albuterol inhaler frequently, report it to the pharmacist to consult with that patient. Pete, go out and talk to that patient. They just got this albuterol inhaler six weeks ago. Albuterol overuse is the first sign that the patient is inadequately treated. Now, are they inadequately treated because of a low dose or is the dose of the medication might need to be increased? Or where you can be very valuable is check that refill history and say, hey, Pete, I think the reason why this patient needs this albuterol inhaler so frequently is they're not using their Advair. And a great story happened, oh, about six, eight months ago in the pharmacy, had a patient that was uh, getting their albuterol inhaler a little bit too frequent, came in to pick it up. And I said, you know, you haven't been getting your Simbacort, because Brad reported that to me, my superstar technician. And Brad said, they're not using the Simbacort as prescribed. And the guy said to me, well, that's 75 bucks for the Simbacort and the albuterol was about 50. I said, okay. So I yelled back to Brad, hey, Brad, can you find me a coupon for Simbacort? Brad worked some magic on his keyboard. He said, find you a $75 off coupon. It just so happened that this lady's copay was $75. So I said to her, hey, we're able to process your Simbacort now for a zero Copay. She was delighted. So how much money did we save? What's the answer? Go ahead, say it. No, you're wrong. It's not $75. That's the easy answer. But think about it because she was so well controlled. She didn't need her $50 albuterol inhaler every month. So she not only saved 75 on the Simbacort, but also 50 by not needing the albuterol inhaler so much. You see how important you pharmacy technicians can be with your magical fingers finding coupons for the patient and reporting things like poor adherence to the pharmacist. Most importantly, do not let this patient buy an epinephrine inhaler, a primatine mist inhaler, because it is too stimulating on the heart. Whenever I have a student pharmacist, I like to have some fun with them. I'll take them out front and I'll say, well, let's uh, practice our brand and generic names. Hey, tell me, what's uh, the active ingredient in Lotrimin? And we all know the answer is is all right. And I give them a big smile and I'll say, eh, you're uh, sort of right. It depends on what Lotrimin we're looking at. Lotrimin jock itch spray, that's myconazole. I know you're more familiar with the name Micotin or Monostat for myconazole, but that's what's in Lotrimin jock itch spray. Lotrimin AF foot powder, that's also myconazole. Lotrimin daily prevention, that's tolnaftate. That's what we had before we even had the azol fungals, antifungals over the counter. And so this will lead to a really nice robust discussion with respect to cross-branding. What's in Dulcolax? Well, we all know that's Bazacadel, right? Those little orange pills, five milligrams each. And uh, my response to that is, uh, well, yes, yeah, sort of. Well, Dulcolax tablets are five milligram tablets of Bazacadel. Dulcolax suppository, 10 milligrams of Bazacadel. Dulcolax soft chews, magnesium hydroxide, 1200 milligrams. Those soft chews are the same thing as what's in Philips Milk of Magnesia. And the Dulcolax pink softener, is DocuSate 100. You guys buy that in bottles of a thousand and dispense it. We commonly call it Colace. 
So then I discussed uh, an incident that happened once at the pharmacy for a bowel prep. The doctor's office sent over a prescription. It said bisacadel, capsules, 100 milligrams, four capsules at bedtime the night before your sonogram. So Brad brought that over to me and says, is this what you really want? And I said, nope, Brad, that is not at all what we want. Made a call to the doctor's office. They thanked me profusely. It changed it to bisacadel, five milligram tablets, four capsules at bedtime the night before the sonogram. So you can see where we have these types of problems where doctors are writing for Dulcolax capsules, 100 milligrams. And what they really mean to say was they meant Dulcolax tablets, five milligrams. Another question that we frequently get is vitamin D. Vitamin D deficiency is very common where we are here in central Pennsylvania. And for those of you that are practicing in the South, I know you probably don't see a whole lot of vitamin D deficiency, but it's probably a little more prevalent than you think because of everybody staying inside and using sunscreen. So vitamin D, uh, how much can you give a patient for vitamin D? Well, I tell my student pharmacists that we can recommend up to 2,000 units of vitamin D without doing that blood test to 25 hydroxy vitamin D level. And almost 70% of the patients in central Pennsylvania are vitamin D deficient, probably a little less down south. But also when you think too, you have good weather, but you're also, many of you are working inside and frequently using sunscreen when you go outside. It takes about five quarts or 3,000 kilocalories of milk to equal the 2,000 units in one of those capsules that we recommend. It also takes five tablets of calcium carbonate to get to that same level of 2,000 international units. That's way too much calcium to get to that 400 international units of vitamin D. Vitamin D levels for 25-hydroxy vitamin D, if that level is less than 12, it's going to be associated with vitamin D deficiency, which can lead to rickets, especially in little kids and children. And in adults, us older ones, it can lead to osteomalacia or weakening of the bones. If that 25-hydroxy vitamin D level is between 12 and 20, it's generally considered inadequate for bone and overall health in healthy individuals. If it's over 20, it's generally considered adequate for overall health in healthy individuals. But at Dr. Gates' office, we would treat anybody that was less than 30. 20 is okay, but definitely under 20, you want to treat it. But a lot of docs will do it under 30. You just don't want to go over 50 because we're seeing more and more emerging evidence that you can see a hypervitaminosis D, weakness, fatigue, sleepiness, headache, loss of appetite, dry mouth, metallic taste, nausea, and vomiting, you can see a lot of side effects from that. And for you technicians that are practicing in the South, vitamin D from the sun is a major source. Approximately 5 to 30 minutes of sun exposure between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., at least twice a week to the face, arms, leg, and back, without sunscreen usually leads to sufficient amounts of vitamin D. A local dermatologist told me that it's easier to treat vitamin D deficiency than it is to treat skin cancer. So using a sunscreen is really important. Although it does block vitamin D, and you might even see low levels of vitamin D like I described, this local dermatologist told me, Pete, always tell them to use the sunscreen. It's easier for me to treat vitamin D levels that are low with a vitamin D supplement than it is to treat skin cancer. However, and this is a fun thing just to bring up, the American Heart Association published an article back in February that said 46 million blood pressure readings were analyzed and exposure to ultraviolet sunlight was associated with a lower systolic blood pressure. This sun exposure actually made people's top number go down on their blood pressure. This two to three point reduction was not due to vitamin D, but to nitric oxide levels, which is also activated by sunlight. The two to three point drop accounts for a 10% decrease in cardiovascular events. So just lowering blood pressure, as we know, two or three points accounts for a 10% decrease in cardiovascular events. That's really important with blood pressure control, but they also found that with sun exposure and skipping the sunscreen. I, however, will wait for a lot more evidence before I tell anybody not to to use a sunscreen because there's just too much evidence for skin cancer. Our alcoholic 
population is also a very special need population when it comes to vitamin therapy. And vitamins A, D, E, and K, we know those as the fat-soluble vitamins. They're the ones that hang around in our body and accumulate the most. Actually, vitamin K doesn't do that, but A, D, and E certainly do. They are often deficient in patients with chronic pancreatitis or alcoholic liver disease. They just don't absorb those vitamins and process them very well. And also, let us not rule out that they might have a very, very poor diet. Thiamine, vitamin B1 deficiency, you're all familiar with that. That's the 100 milligram one. And when you open a bottle, it stinks. We know what thiamine all smells like the minute you run it through your pill counter or dump it on a counting tray. Vitamin B1 deficiency is found in up to 80% of adults with chronic alcohol abuse. Vitamin B6 pyridoxin deficiency occurs in over half of your alcoholic patients. And that's also caused by reduced intake and increased breakdown of pyridoxin during ethanol metabolism. Folic acid or vitamin B9. Two-thirds of your binge drinkers will have folic acid deficiency that's caused by poor absorption or reduced intake and increased urinary excretion. So there's three different ways they're going to have suppressed levels of folic acid, decreased intake, decreased absorption, and peeing out more. This can all cause a mac always causes a macrocytic anemia and intestinal malabsorption. Zinc. Half your alcoholics need zinc as well. Vitamin B12 is a little bit odd, though. You, they seem to carry a little bit higher levels, and that's due to those hepatocytes, those liver cells that get injured by alcohol and release the stored vitamin B12 that they had. So you might not need to supplement for vitamin B12. Well, pharmacy technicians can be very helpful when it comes to caring for our alcoholic patients as well. If you are filling a prescription for naltrexone or Vivitrol, naltrexone tablets, which is Revia, disulfiram or Antibuse, or a Camprosate or Camprol, anytime you're filling those, just remind the pharmacist to go out and review those nutritional needs of his alcoholic patients and make sure that they are taking adequate supplements and hopefully eating a good diet. These drugs are all used for alcohol use disorder, and the pharmacist needs to be consulted for appropriate vitamin recommendations, especially thiamine. That thiamine deficiency can cause what's called Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, which can cause uh, mental health issues. So it's very important to prevent that Wernicke-Korsakoff psychosis with adequate thiamine supplementation. Well, another population that needs our expertise when it comes to vitamins are your bariatric surgery patients. And just the way this usually goes down in the, the real world of healthcare, you know, these patients will be referred to a surgeon by their family practice doc. And after, you know, they've attempted weight loss and uh, nutritional consults and all that, then the bariatric surgeon will see them. So they'll do the surgery and then kind of just discharge them back over to their family practice doc. And then the family practice doc is expected to take over this. And most of them don't. They don't have a lot of expertise in the vitamin therapy. So it lands frequently on us pharmacists lap. So vitamin D will see a deficiency there because of decreased fat absorption. Remember, vitamin D is fat soluble. And because we're absorbing less fat, we're going to absorb less vitamin D. That RU and Y, the most common gastric bypass and that biliopancreatic diversion are more likely to produce vitamin D deficiency than any other surgeries. Have the physician check the 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels. Also, you're going to want to supplement with some vitamin A, vitamin D, and 300 micrograms of vitamin K. But remember, with vitamin K, what we have to do, that's right, we have to make sure they're not smokers. Vitamin B1 or thiamine is also primarily absorbed in the duodenum and the proximal jejunum. That's in the upper part of the small intestine. Bariatric surgery bypasses the duodenum and the proximal jejunum, and the thiamine deficiency may occur within a few weeks post-op, so make sure that they are definitely getting a vitamin supplement. If the patient has persistent vomiting or severely diminished oral intake, they are at a very high risk for deficiency. Thiamine deficiency may be exacerbated or made worse by changes in the gut flora. Some other bariatric surgery vitamin needs folic acid. Uh, supplemented with 0.4 to 2 milligrams per day. That is especially in women that are still menstruating, that are of childbearing age. 
any woman that is listening to this presentation, if you have functioning ovaries, I want you to take a folic acid supplement. And any of the guys that are listening, that woman in your life, make sure she's taking a folic acid supplement because it's critically important to prevent birth defects. Ever since we started really pushing folic acid supplementation and even supplementing it in the grains and flowers that we consume uh, since 1998, we have reduced spinal bifida and anencephaly in half by folic acid supplementation. So every woman, I want you to make sure if you are menstruating and you have childbearing potential that you are taking a folic acid supplement. Vitamin B12, that's the most common deficiency after Ruin Y surgery. At least 33% of the patients will become vitamin B12 deficient. And we'll see those noticeable B12 deficiencies. You know what they look like, right? The same as what we were talking about with our metformin patient. They can have some irritability, weakness, but it's numbness, loss of appetite, and tingling in the extremities are signs of low B12, as well as anemia. Make sure that their doctors are doing tests for uh, macrocytic anemia to check for vitamin B12 deficiency. Consider vitamin B12 injections if they're significantly deficient after you've used your 1,000 micrograms per day. Start them all on 1,000 micrograms per day. Even with this gastric bypass surgery, they will, through passive diffusion, get enough vitamin B12 to prevent the deficiency. But if that's not adequate, then we need to step it up and go to the B12 injections where you start out one injection a week for four weeks and then go to the once a month injection thereafter. Other needs for bariatric surgery patients. As I said, bariatric surgery patients are very complicated and it doesn't look like a lot of our healthcare professionals are really following up with them. Calcium is a big one. And think of calcium carbonate. You dispense them all the time, those big clunky pills. Well, they require acid for absorption, but remember we bypass the stomach with the surgery so we don't have a lot of acid floating around. So this bypass will decrease the stomach acid production. So your best option is not calcium carbonate. Remember that comes from oyster shells and oyster shells lay in the ocean. They don't dissolve down there, right? They need acid for dissolution. If the oyster shells just dissolved in water, oysters would be either homeless or naked. So what we want to recommend is calcium citrate. You might be more familiar with the over-the-counter name Citrical. That's going to be your best option because it does not require acid for dissolution. So while you're recommending Citrical, you want to make sure that you do the chewable or gummies. That's going to be your best option for calcium citrate. Iron supplementation, avoid sustained release iron and enteric coated products because it's going to go right past the maximal area of absorption in the duodenum. You might see decreased iron absorption due to decreased stomach acid production as well. So you don't want to use any sustained release products, just those little red ones or the green ones, depending on what your pharmacy has. Those little ferrous sulfate 325s, that is the best way to get absorption. And let us not forget tablet size. That's why we wanted to go with chewables or gummies for the calcium. Tablet size is really important because two months post-op, all medications should be given in a liquid dosage form or a crushed tablet or even open the capsule if that's permissible. If a tablet has to be used, start with the smallest tablet available. Solid dosage forms, remember, don't recommend anything that's larger than an M&M. So recommend things that are smaller than an M&M candy. Some other challenges with your bariatric surgery patients, the excipients, that stuff in those products, they need to avoid sucrose and corn syrup and maltose, fructose, lactose, honey, mannitol, and sorbitol, any of those to minimize what's called dumping syndrome, which dumping syndrome is due to a lot of sugar being absorbed and it kind of makes a, an osmotic mess in the stomach and the patient throws up. Uh, I've had a lot of gastric bypass surgery patients tell me that the reason that they think they lost weight wasn't so much the smaller stomach as they were throwing up all the time and that can be due to dumping syndrome. So a lot of doctors will use a carabose or precost. Remember it's that diabetic drug that our patients take with meals that will lower those postprandial, those after meal glucose levels and decrease the chance for dumping syndrome. So if you see a carabose for a gastric bypass patient, it's probably not going to be used for type 2 diabetes. It's probably going to be used more frequently to prevent dumping syndrome. 
Well, we have angiotensin receptor blockers. You see those all over the place, right? Losartan, that's one you're buying in thousand. Every store seems to buy their Losartan in very large quantities. That was the first one that was available. It was the first one to go generic, and that's why most everyone's on it. But it actually, of all the angiotensin receptor blockers, it's the worst one because it has a very short half-life. When you think most of your patients are taking their blood pressure medications, in the morning, right? Have it in the pill reminder next to your coffee pot. That's where I keep mine. But you think about it after half, five half-lives, and that's the magic number. After five half-lives, you have a negligible amount of drug in the system. You think, let's just do it mathematically. If it, you had a level of 100, and in the half-life you have 50, another half-life you have 25, another half-life you have 12 and a half, another half-life you have 6.25, and another half-life you have 3.125. So after five half-lives, you only have really 3%. So when you look at low sartan, after what, about 10 or 12 hours? You would have a negligible amount of losartan in your system by 7 or 8 o'clock at night. Why that is so significant is when are you most likely to have a heart attack? Between 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning when your blood pressure is not being controlled because you don't have any losartan floating around in your blood supply. So the best angiotensin receptor blockers now that they're all available generically, irbisartan, and telmosartan are your two longest acting angiotensin receptor blockers. So the question is, Professor Pete, with your blood pressure, what do you take? Yeah, that's a simple one. I take irbisartan because that's the longest acting one. I don't want to have a stroke when I wake up in the morning. Well, we know a day doesn't go by when we don't dispense benzodiazepines. And should we be dispensing those benzos for the elderly? Is there a safe one? Eh, it's probably none of them are really safe. Which ones will do the least harm is what I think we want to really look at. So all benzos are implicating in causing delirium as well as increasing the risk of falls. Of all the benzodiazepines that are available, and you know there's at least uh, probably eight or ten of them, the ones that are least likely to accumulate in our elderly patients, we call them the LOT drugs, L-O-T, L for lorazepam, O for oxazepam, T for temazepams, and they undergo glucuronid conjugation, which is just a very fancy way of saying they don't get metabolized significantly in the liver. They just kind of get latched on to excrete it out of the liver and they're gone without any drug interactions. So those three drugs are probably the safest one. I never recommend clonazepam or diazepam or never alprazolam for an elderly patient because they undergo liver metabolism and as our patients get older, they can accumulate. So the ones that I recommend are the lot drugs, lorazepam, oxazepam, and tenazepam. Also avoid non-benzo hypnotics like azolpiclone, more commonly known as Lunesta, Zolpidem, more commonly known as Ambien, or Zalpilon, which is most commonly known as Sonata, due to the fall risk and delirium and impairment of memory as well. Well, since we're talking about elderly people, let's take a look at heart failure pharmacotherapy. A lot of your patients I know come up to you technicians and say, do I need all of this stuff? And you know what the short answer is? Yes, you do. We have drugs that are called mortality or most likely to keep you from dying. So mortality re reducing, that's what's going to keep you alive. Morbidity reducing is going to help you feel better but not necessarily extend your life as morbidity. So what we need for mortality reducing drugs, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, the angiotensin receptor blockers are what we use for patients that get that ACE cough. Our heart failure patients also need to be on beta blockers. Many of them are going to be on aldosterone antagonists like spironolactone or aplaronone. A lot of them are also going to be on Arnie's like Entresto. Now keep in mind with Entresto, they, if they're on Entresto, they should never be on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. They should not be on that because there's already an ARB in Entresto and those patients can have increased risk for angioedema. If they're African-American, they can also be taking Bidil, which is hydralazine and isosorbide. This first column of drugs are all the heart failure drugs that will keep you living longer. The next column of drugs we can recommend uh, to make our patient feel better, diuretics to get rid of that excess of fluid that accumulates. Digoxin just kind of overall helps the heart beat a little bit stronger, and Ivabradine also helps with our heart patients as well by slowing by making the heart function at peak performance, even though they are in heart failure. 
Now, of the beta blockers that we have, three of them are what's really recommended for heart failure. The first one is metoprolol. The second one is carbidolol. And the third one is bisoprolol or zebeta. Of all of them, carbidolol is probably my favorite drug. I had a patient back in the 1990s that was put on Coreg before it even was released to the common market. He was scheduled for a heart transplant. And once they put him on carbidolol, he never needed it. He lived an extra probably 18 years before he passed away. He only passed away uh, maybe about eight or nine years ago. But carbidolol is truly a miracle drug, as are metoprolol. Now, with metoprolol, make sure it's XL. Do not recommend the tartrate. You want to recommend the succinate or generic toprol XL. Or bisoprolol can also be dosed once a day. And ideally, with these drugs, you want to push the dose to Coreg 25 BID, which is the maximum dose, toprol XL to 200 a day, or Zebeta 10 milligrams a day. Of course, use their generic equivalents. Well, let's take a look at statin potency. This is another drug our heart failure patients and our uh, heart attack patients should be on to keep those blood vessels open. And, you know, we have lots of them and people always say, well, I can't tolerate any of the statins. They really need to look at all of these because two of them, rosuvastatin and pravastatin, they're the water soluble ones. They're the ones that are least likely to accumulate in the muscles and cause the least amount of muscle pain. So that's pravastatin and rosuvastatin. Water soluble, they don't really get run through the liver and they don't really have any drug interactions. So just to go across the board here, and this is a really good chart you should probably print out for your pharmacy. Let's look at that 41% bar. 20 milligrams of atorvastatin is equivalent to four milligrams of pativastatin or Livolo. 20 milligrams of atorvastatin is equivalent to lovastatin 80 milligrams or pravastatin 80 milligrams. Notice that it only takes five milligrams of rosuvastatin or Crestor to equal 80 milligrams of pravastatin, lovastatin, or 20 milligrams of atorvastatin. Five milligrams of rosuvastatin equals 40 milligrams of simvastatin. So tell the pharmacist you're working with if a patient says, oh, I'm not doing well on that simvastatin 40, you know, it's making my legs hurt. Recommend rosuvastatin, just five milligrams, right? You're giving an equivalent dose, equivalent LDL or bad cholesterol lowering, and it's only five milligrams. You can kind of get into the heads of your patients a little bit by knowing these equivalents. I know many of you do practice in the South and you get your son all the time, but up here in the North, we often see problems with seasonal affective disorder. Up to 10% of the people living in these northern latitudes will get depressed in the fall and in the winter. And it's thought that it's the shorter days trigger changes in melatonin, serotonin, and other neurotransmitters. And it's more commonly seen in women. Now for prevention, I know the answer is let's everybody move to South Carolina, North Carolina, and Florida. But we don't want to jam up your roads any more than they already are in the winter. So let's take a look at some pharmacotherapy rather than have everybody move south. Current thinking is to begin therapy before depression starts. Maybe let's start this in September and start with bupropion XL. Well, Butrin XL helps 84% of the patients remain depression free. However, placebo is 72% effective. Patients will start bupropion XL, well, Butrin XL, in the fall, usually around September through November, and then it can taper it off in the spring. If they actively have a case of seasonal affective disorder and we do need to treat it, then maybe we would just want to start treating with either light therapy or light bulbs in a light box. Prozac is equally effective to light boxes. Sertraline or Zoloft has also been used with pretty good efficacy as well. Well, I know every time you guys are running those Prozac and Seroquel and Zoloft prescriptions, you're always seeing these flags come up for serotonin syndrome. So let's go over serotonin syndrome. So you as technicians have a really good understanding of what this is. All of the SSRIs and SNRIs, and I'll, I'll define those for you, as well as the MAOIs, which you're very rarely going to see MAOIs in your practice. You're not going to see those a whole lot. Can cause serotonin syndrome, especially when we get to the higher doses. 
Serotonin toxicity occurs with the addition or the increase of a known serotonergic or a serotonin increasing agent in an established medication regimen. So usually one drug doesn't seem to cause a whole lot of problems, but boy, it seems that the combinations of those drugs can really do that. So let's kind of dig into that a little bit more and see what these drugs are. First of all, we want to take a look at what the patient looks like that has serotonin syndrome. And what they're going to have are some neuromuscular effects of a tremor, hyperreflexia, where they're like real jumpy and jerky, clonus, which is rhythmic muscle spasms that can be spontaneous, inducible, or they can even occur in the eyes. They can also have dilated pupils and increased sweating. Sweating's a big one. Increased heart rate and increased breathing rate. They can also experience mental status changes like agitation and excitement, restlessness, confusion, and delirium. So these are all signs and symptoms of serotonin syndrome. So these are what a patient can present with if they have that disease state that can be caused by these combinations of drugs. Drugs frequently that are implicated, we said SSRIs and SNRIs and TCAAs, that sounds like alphabet soup to me, but SSRIs are fluoxetine and sertraline and paroxetine, you know all of those. Uh, TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline and nortriptyline, and there's probably another half a dozen you could add that are seldom used, as well as the SNRIs, selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, duloxetine, cymbalta, or venlafaxine, effexor can all cause it. Mirtazapine can, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, that's Nardil, some of those older drugs, you Parnate, you probably won't ever dispense those. Carbamazepine or Tegretol, you probably dispense that a lot. Cyclobenzaprine or Flexerol, we do that all the time. Actually, for your information, cyclobenzaprine is very closely related to the tricyclic antidepressants. Linezolid, dextromethorphan, yeah, dextromethorphan, the cough syrup over the counter, as well as mepiridine or Demerol, which you very seldom use, methadone and tramadol, all can cause serotonin syndrome. Well, you're a valuable uh, help to us pharmacists, and here's where you can help with serotonin syndrome. Unfortunately, these serotonin syndrome drug interactions are frequently overridden because you just see them all the time. It isn't a big deal in many cases, but it can be a big deal with high dose, high numbers of serotonin drugs, and especially in elderly or frail patients. So any high dose drugs for depression can cause serotonin syndrome, especially if it's given with other drugs in the same class. Although most of those level two interactions, you know, that we always kind of override without paying a lot of attention to, this can be a problem, especially if it's high dose. If you see Prozac 20 and Trazodone 50, probably not going to sweat that one. But if you see Prozac 40 combined with uh, Trazodone 300 milligram, and then they're put on Tramadol for pain, that can be a big problem, especially in an elderly patient, especially if that elderly patient is frail. Well, another problem that we can have, speaking of dextromethorphan, is robotripping or dextromethorphan abuse. And there's four different levels you can achieve by consuming too much dextromethorphan. If we get to the first plateau, that's mild stimulation. The second plateau is euphoric hallucinations, and that's probably where a lot of people try to aim for that are doing this. The third plateau is distorted visual perception or loss of coordination. They're stumbling around a whole lot. And the fourth is dissociative sedation. That's like ketamine, you know, that the person's totally uh, dissociated and disconnected from their personality. What concerns me, and this is why this chart, you should probably print this out and it should probably be pasted your front cash register is the signs. We talked about the signs and symptoms, but look at the doses of these. Although it's called robo tripping, it concerns me, but not as much Robitussin DM does not concern me as much as Delsum does. Look at Robitussin DM. You've got to drink a 240 mil, an eight ounce bottle of that stuff. Well, all that guaifenesin in it causes stomach upset and makes you puke anyhow. So we won't have to worry as much. Delsum scares the living daylights out of me. Look at level four. 
88 milliliters, that one bottle of Dalsum. If a kid chugs a whole bottle of Dalsum, they can get to stage four dissociative sedation just with one bottle. And there's no guaifenesin, remember, in Dalsum, so they're not even going to throw up. Another drug that should scare me too, and it does, is Coracidin HBP with its 30 milligrams per dose. 17 to 50 tablets of that will put a kid into level four. Make sure that we are watching those dextromethorphan sales up front. There are even, I think, 11 or 12 states that require it to be kept behind a counter like you would Sudafed. So if you're in a state, say like Pennsylvania, that doesn't have that restriction, make sure your clerks are watching for signs of teenagers and people buying excessive bottles of dextromethorphan containing cough syrup. Never allow teens to buy dextromethorphan products, especially in large quantities. Techs can also help by watching Robitussin DM as well as those other high dose and Dalsum and Coracidin HBP. And always grab the pharmacist and have him take a look if you have any big concerns. Well, there's no surprise that we do have an opioid epidemic. One of the things that you will frequently see as pharmacy technicians is morphine milligram equivalents exceeded. And let's go over what MMEs are, morphine milligram equivalents are. And as we continue to battle this opioid epidemic in this nation, a lot of our patients are coming to us with Suboxone or Buprenorphine prescriptions. So we're dispensing Buprenorphine 8-2 twice a day. It's probably the most common uh, medication-assisted treatment that we do see. So, you know, 16 milligrams of Buprenorphine, it doesn't sound like much, does it? Hey, 16 milligrams of Atenolol isn't much. 16 milligrams of Lysinopril isn't much. But 16 milligrams of buprenorphine is a lot. When we convert buprenorphine 16 milligrams to its morphine milligram equivalent, it equals 480 morphine milligram equivalents. That's the equivalent of four Oxycontin 80 or 48 Norco 10 or 96 Norco 5. Those are all equivalent doses. So when we give a patient two Suboxone strips a day, that's the equivalent of 96 Norco tablets a day if we're comparing morphine milligram equivalents. Also, those two buprenorphine strips equal two fentanyl 100 or four fentanyl 50, or they would equal 16 morphine sulfate ER30 or five methadone 10. So those strips they do have some punch to them, equaling 480 morphine milligram equivalents. How can you help? First of all, calculate those MMEs. Remember, the Center for Disease Control tells us that anybody that is over 50 morphine milligram equivalents should have Narcan in their house. Depending on your state's laws, in Pennsylvania, we have standing orders. I can give anybody Narcan that walks in my front door and process it under our Commonwealth physician, Dr. Rachel Levine's. So consult with your pharmacist first before you do that. But don't be intimidated by these morphine milligram equivalents. Let's learn how to calculate them. For buprenorphine, just multiply the daily dose by 30. So if they're on eight a day, it's 240. If they're on 16, which is pretty standard, that's going to be 480. For hydrocodone, it's milligram per milligram. So if they're on Norco 10, four tablets a day, that's 40. For oxycodone, multiply 1.5 to get your morphine milligram equivalent. So if they're on oxy 80, that would equal 120 morphine milligram equivalents. The other stuff, the, the fentanyls and the hydromorphones, let the pharmacist worry about that. Let's talk about the blood thinners that we frequently work with in the pharmacy. And how I like to teach my students up at St. Francis is red clots versus white clots. Red clots are those thick clots that develop in the legs. That The people that have to wear those white stockings, they develop in areas of low pressure, either the top part of the heart or deep in the legs. That's where we use anticoagulant therapy such as warfarin. And that protects against DBTs or deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary emboli, which are blood clots in the lungs. So it's clots in the legs, clots in the lungs. That's what we're really trying to prevent. So for the hospital pharmacists, you've seen lots of heparin and enoxaparin. In the community pharmacy, we'll see an occasional lovenox, but we see a whole lot of warfarin, pradaxa, 
apixaban, rivaroxaban, and edoxaban. Apixaban, rivaroxaban, and edoxaban, they're all factor 10A inhibitors. They work on that particular clotting factor. And the easiest way to remember it is look at the generic name, XA, 10A, the Roman numeral, ban. It bans 10A. White clots are mostly platelets and they form in the arteries where we have high pressure. So they're more for prevention of MI, like a heart attack and stroke. So we're going to use antiplatelet therapies such as aspirin, clopidogrel, prasugrel, or ticagrelor in combination frequently as well to prevent the white clot formation. None of these drugs are reversible. They attach to that platelet and they stay there for the lifespan of the platelet. The platelets that you're making today or right now as you're listening to this lecture will last you in your body about five to seven days. These antiplatelets are used after a stent to decrease clots at the site of the stent. The bare metal stents that they use, you'll have to use antiplatelets for the combination of antiplatelet drugs for at least 30 days. And the drug eluding stents, you're going to use the combination for up to one year, whether it's clopidogrel and aspirin or prasugrel and aspirin or ticagrelor and aspirin. But they're going to be kept on aspirin forever. And finally, let's talk about humidifiers. I want to educate you on hum humidifiers because the truth is most pharmacists aren't. So before you sell a patient out front a humidifier, what should you do? What should you know? What should you discuss with the patients? Every homeowner should have a hygrometer, which is a little device that measures the temperature and the relative humidity. I had an allergist tell me once before you recommend a humidifier, recommend a hygrometer first and make sure that the humidity level is between 40 and 50 percent. That's the ideal comfort one. Any lower than 40 is a little bit too dry. Anything over 60 causes an increase in dust mites. Humidifiers, if you recommend those to just everybody, it can make the allergies worse because dust mites and mold like those high humidity levels. So a humidifier will increase the humidity and make allergies worse. Mites, those little dust mites are microscopic, contain about 70 to 75% water by weight and must maintain this to reproduce. Their primary source of water for dust mites is ambient water vapor. For dust mite control, you want to keep the humidity levels low. An air conditioner or a dehumidifier can help keep humidity levels low, below 50 if possible. So you folks down south, you're going to be running your dehumidifiers in the basement and your air conditioners upstairs to keep those humidity levels under 50. 30% is adequate for most people. Environmental controls to contain those dust mites, frequently, you know, wash carpets and bedding and stop the animals, vacuum them and throw them in the wash if you can. When you sell that patient a humidifier, here's some tips I want you to share with them. Tell them to make sure they change the water in their portable humidifiers every day. Dump out the old water, fill it up with fresh. Every three days, you want them to thoroughly scrub out the reservoir, even rinsing it with hydrogen peroxide or a dilute bleach solution to kill those bacteria and fungi off that are growing. Little kids can get scalded with warm steam vaporizer, so make sure you tell those patients not to buy a warm steam. There's no need to add anything to a warm steam vaporizer. Menthol and camphor make the room smell better, but they can actually ruin a cool mist humidifier, but they provide no therapy. It's the water in the air is what you need. And the truth is most of your allergists are going to tell you setting pans of water on radiators and change them daily will provide adequate moisture to a room without soaking the carpets, without ruining the drapes, the drywall, the pictures, and encouraging dust mite growth. Okay, now that we have that settled and we decided we're going to sell this patient a humidifier, what do we want to sell them? Well, the ultrasonic ones are pretty good. They're quiet and they have an ultrasonic sound vibration similar to when you see people vaping instead of smoking those vaping pens. They use ultrasonic piezo vibrators is what they're called and that creates that nice cool mist. Well, that's what you have with this type of humidifier. There's also the impeller ones. They're the cheaper ones that have this cool mist and it puts a high speed rotating disc. It causes a real hissing sound. 
Evaporative ones transmit moisture through the air by having a fan blow through a moist and absorbent material like a belt or a wick or even a filter. And the steam vaporizers, as we said, puts out a high level of steam. They're called warm mist humidifiers, but they are not recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics because of the chance to scald a small child. Pharmacy technicians, you can be of great help to us because you know as much as the pharmacists do as this topic is seldom addressed in pharmacy school. And at the register, make sure you cover those humidifier care points. And for my last slide, let's talk about something else that's never covered in pharmacy school. I didn't know this till my niece, who is an optometrist, said to me at the end of a presentation that I did on eye care, Uncle Pete, why didn't you tell him about the cap colors on ophthalmic products? Well, whenever you dispense an ophthalmic product, it should have a different color cap on depending on the mechanism of action. So all of the anti-infectives or the antibiotic ones should have a tan cap on the top. Anti-inflammatories should be pink, like Pred Forte. Your ones that dilate the pupil, the midriatics, they always have a red colored cap. Think of atropine or tropicamide. Non-steroidal ones like Keterolac, they're going to have gray. The meiotics like pilocarpine are going to be green. Beta blockers can be yellow or blue depending on the strength. The adrenergic antagonists are purple like Alphagan. Uh, whenever we dispense Trusopt and Azop, we're going to see an orange colored cap. And the prostaglandin ones like the Zalatan that you keep in the fridge or the other two that are available, Lumigan and Travitan, they're going to have a turquoise or teal colored cap. That helps your patients better identify what their products are. So if they are going for refractive surgery, you can tell them to use the gray one or the brown one. Just make sure you tell the patients to immediately replace that cap so you don't mix up your cap colors. I want to thank you for joining me, Professor Pete, for this presentation. And I can't wait till we meet again. Thank you so much and have a great day on the bench.